Uh, for those of you watching online, I'll say hello. I'll also, uh, for those of you at Pecola, uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, we want to celebrate last Sunday night. There were 29 people who were baptized, and so we can together, uh, both at Pecola and here, just celebrate that. Can we clap and just say we're grateful? <laughs> Uh, see God's work. If you missed last Sunday night, uh, you, you missed a great blessing, and God willing, uh, next summer we're going to see more people come to faith in Christ and more people be baptized. And so we do. We celebrate together as a church. Um, I'm excited about this new series that we are in. We're in the book of Ephesians. And so if you missed last week, you, you, you missed that we, we're going to have three major themes that we're going to be hitting as we walk through the book of Ephesians. And these, these three themes, they follow the basic structure of of the letter. And so the three themes that we're going to be hitting are as follows. Number one, we want to learn to think biblically. Number two, we want to live authentically. And number three, we want to fight strategically. So as we walk through Ephesians, we're going to see chapters one through three are devoted to helping us learn to think biblically. Um, chapters four through the middle part of chapter six, we're going to be learning how to live authentically. We don't want to just know stuff. We want to be able to live it. And then we're going to close out with about a nine-week study on spiritual warfare and taking on the armor of God, learning how to fight strategically. And so we're excited about getting this thing started. If you did miss last week's message, you can go online. Uh, you can check that out. It will be uh, available and ready for you to watch. And so uh, to introduce a message I want to talk to you about this morning, I'll give you an illustration. A couple of years ago, um, I decided that I want to plant some fruit trees and so I went out uh, the place where we were building our house, northwest of Worcester. There was a perfect spot. I, I got 20-plus fruit trees, uh, different types of peach trees and apple trees and pear trees. I laid them all out. I put them into the ground. I ran water to them. Um, I put a lot of care and a lot of attention into those fruit trees. And so I, I was excited that this spring I started seeing those fruit trees produce fruit. I got a number of apples that started developing and so, you, you know, the way fruit trees work is you, you don't love a fruit tree because of the way that it looks, right? You love a fruit tree because of what it produces. So a fruit tree is the best word I know how to use is a utilitarian thing. And utilitarian is when something is practical or useful rather than attractive. So I'm not really concerned when it comes to fruit trees about whether or not I think that fruit tree is attractive or pretty or beautiful. I just want the fruit tree to what? To produce fruit. So I'm going to love the fruit tree. I'm going to invest in the fruit tree. I'm going to connect to the fruit tree. You know, as long as it continues to produce fruit for me, I am pro fruit tree. Like I'm hanging with the fruit tree. But if that fruit tree ever stops producing fruit, I'm going to start getting aggravated. And if I go out there next year and I've invested and I've watered and I've planted and I've fertilized, I've done all these things and the fruit tree's not producing, I'm going to start saying, why haven't you done your job? I did my job. Why don't you do yours? If I go out there the second year, the third year, the fifth year, and those fruit trees never produce any fruit, eventually I'm going to quit caring about the fruit tree. I'm going to say that is a dumb fruit tree. It, 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 I don't know what's wrong with it, but it, you know, I'm just going to give up on the fruit tree and walk away from it altogether. And if you understand the way fruit trees work, you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense if you're talking about fruit trees. But imagine with me if I applied that same principle to Aaron, my wife. Imagine with me if I said, um, Aaron, I have invested in you and I have, uh, you know, I've, I've watered and planted and served and done all these things for you and you're not producing anything for me. Guys, you know how well that's going to work out, right? You know how well that would work if you look at your wife the way that you look at a fruit tree. Like you're not producing anything for me and you get frustrated, you get disappointed, and you give up on her because she's not producing whatever it is that you want her to produce. The reason I start with that illustration is because I think that we all need to realize that when it comes to our relationship with God, we all have a tendency to, at times, approach Him the way that I approach a fruit tree. Where we go to Him and we say, okay, God, I have prayed, I have served, I have given, I have lived my life better than somebody else over here, and yet I'm going to the fruit tree of prayer, I'm going to the fruit tree of whatever it is, and I'm seeing that, that I'm not getting what it is that I want to get from you right now. And the challenge is, if we're not careful, our relationship with God will become very utilitarian. Where we, we see God as something that is practical or useful rather than someone who is attractive. 
And I just want to stop as we get started this morning and ask you to consider this possibility. What if God doesn't want you to see him first and foremost as something that is practical or useful? What if God first and foremost wants you to see him as someone who is attractive? Someone who has inherent beauty, someone who has inherent worth, who has inherent value, that whether or not he's producing fruit in this particular season of your life, whether he's answering that prayer that you've prayed or fulfilling the circumstance that you want to see him fulfill, whether he's doing that or not, he's still worth connecting to. He's still worth worshiping and praising. What if it's possible that in your relationship with him, if you were to shift away from seeing God as utilitarian, as just practical or useful, and beginning to see him as someone who is attractive, what if it's possible that your relationship could mature in him? So that this morning, some of you who come in, and it may be the case that you're frustrated in your prayer life because you've gone to the, the fruit tree of prayer and you found that it was empty. You've not gotten what it is that you've prayed for. Um, you've expected God to do something on your behalf, but because of those unmet expectations, you now have a lingering frustration with Him. And for you, the temptation is for you to say, what's the point? What good is God? If I pray and I give and I work and I come to church and I try to live right and my life isn't any better than the person's life beside me, then, then what's the point of serving God? What's the point of worshiping God? Well, I want to speak specifically to that this morning. If that has been a struggle of yours or in the future is going to be, if you'll open up with me to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to begin from the beginning and look in verse 1. Paul gives us just the basic background of this letter, tells us who he's writing it to and those basic things. And so in verses 1 and 2, he says this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints, and this is the audience, who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul writes this letter. There's no specific occasion that we know of that, that brought about the need for this letter. He's writing them a general letter to explain the nature of the gospel, the nature of the church, so that they could come together and grow up in their faith. And so he goes on, and beginning in verse 3, Paul begins to praise God. And I want you to notice the reason why he praises God. Because this is important for us to understand. There's a principle at work here that Paul praises God here. And notice what it is that he praises God for. Verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's essentially saying, Praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's why. Who has blessed us with every, notice this word, spiritual blessing. Paul here does not say with every physical blessing. Now this is key who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, notice the location of these blessings, in the heavenly places in Christ. And so what Paul does in verse 3 is he defines the general reason why he's blessing God, the general reason why he's praising God. So what Paul did not say on the front end, he did not say this. He said, praise God because he has blessed us with a growing economy, with low unemployment, with a rising stock market, with affordable health care, with financial security, with great school systems, with first place at our t-ball tournament, with a new PR on my run, with getting my child potty trained. Paul, he, he doesn't praise God for any of those things. So here's what we need to do. We need to stop for just a second and say, of the things that I just mentioned, are there any of those things that you would praise God for if he did in your life? Like, I promise you, if you're a parent and your kid's like two and a half or three and they're not potty trained yet and they get potty trained, you're like, glory, hallelujah. You know, God is at work in my home. If you teach them how to sleep through the night or they get to a place where they can sleep through the night, you're like, glory to God, hallelujah. Those are things you praise God for. You praise God for all of those physical things. And so we need to say on the front end, we need to praise God. We need to thank God. We need to celebrate when we see those physical things happening in our lives. When we go to the fruit tree of our circumstances and that fruit tree is just overflowing with physical, tangible blessings, we say, God, thank you that you are a good father who gives good gifts to his children. Glory, hallelujah, amen. But... The real question that this passage presents to us is this. What about those times when you do not see physical blessings? 
What about the time when you see that the, ch- the prognosis is not good? What about the times when you see that the job prospects are not promising? What about the time when you see that the relationship is probably not going to be restored? What about those times when you cannot point to physical blessings that lead you to a place of praise, but rather the physical circumstances that you look, around, look, look at when you look at the life that is around you cause you to be frustrated, and if you're real honest, ask the question, what good is God? I have served, I have prayed, I have given, I have fasted, I have attended, I have done all the things that a good Christian is supposed to do, and yet they're the person who was prospered, and I was left here forsaken. What what do you do in your faith when you're at a place where you don't have physical reasons to praise God? I think what Paul is pointing the church in Ephesus, the believers in Ephesus, to realize is that you have to, first of all, focus. If you're going to grow up, you have to look up. Like if you're going to mature in your faith, maturing in your faith doesn't start with you looking around and just counting your earthly blessings that are around you. You have to first start by looking at their spiritual blessings. And can we be honest for a minute, that does not come natural to any of us. Like it doesn't come natural to you to wake up in the morning and say, Oh God, thank you that I have hope in Jesus Christ for eternity. Um, Thank you that you have rooted me in the heavenlies and I am already firm. I have a foundation that is eternal and an inheritance that is unfading and unspoiled. It doesn't come natural for us to do that. And so what Paul does here is he he orients the, the people in Ephesus there and he would orient us to realize that the first focus we need to have is on eternal things, not just earthly things. And much of the victory in living the Christian life in a consistent, steady passion and pursuit of God is getting to a place where the things that we have received up there come to matter to us down here. And so the the central truth that I want to give to you today uh, from these verses right here is this truth. That God's ultimate worth to you cannot depend on God's immediate work in you. There will be seasons, you know this, there will be seasons where you sense God's immediate work in you. He blessed you, He gave you uh, favor, you know, the, the officer pulled you over and he did not give you a ticket even though you deserved one and you prayed, oh God, get me out of this. And for whatever reason, he did. You know, there are going to be seasons where things go your way. There are going to be seasons where you look to the fruit tree of circumstances and you like what you see. But can we all agree that there are going to be seasons where you go to the fruit tree of circumstances and you do not like what you see? And if what you see on the fruit tree of your circumstances determines whether or not you praise God, it determines whether or not you find God worthy, then when what you like, what you see is what you like happening around you, you you find that those things are good then you're going to praise God and say thank you, but when those things are not what you like, you're not going to have a reason to praise Him. You're not going to have a reason to be grateful. And one of the most common challenges that I face in my life, and I'm pretty sure you face in your life, one of the most common challenges you face is getting to a place where you can be grateful to God, not just for the things that you see in front of you, but for the eternal things that He's accomplished that stretch far beyond what you can see happening in the natural realm around you. One of the things I like to do in counseling and and for my own self, remind myself of, if if you picture an iceberg, an iceberg, you basically got the small portion, the tip of the iceberg, that's like 3 4% or whatever of the whole thing. But then under the tip of the iceberg, the part that you don't see is like 90 plus percent of it. And so the primary substance, the primary significance of the iceberg is, is underneath the water. Like, that's the part that you don't see. And so if you think about the circumstances of your life, if you think about the things that are just happening to you today, next week, that, that are totally just physical, natural things, you know, how things go with your kids' grades, how things go in the sports tournament, how things go with your physical health, how things go with your job, 
All of those things that are important. And if, they, if, we, if we go to the fruit tree of our circumstances and they are what we want, we're grateful for them, we praise God for them. If you picture all those things that are physical, natural things that happen for 60, 70, 80 years while we're here on this earth, you can fit all of those things in the tip of the iceberg. And so what that says is that there's something else more significant than just those earthly temporary things. And here are the things that are eternal, your relationship with God and your relationship with people. For, for people who are in Christ, who know others in Christ, that the one thing that we have that is eternal in nature, that doesn't end, that the bulk of what we have as, as followers of Jesus is our relationship with God and, and our relationship with people. And so when we look at what Paul is saying right here, we have to understand that, that God's ultimate worth to you cannot depend on His immediate work in you. That there is much more going on. There is much more than, than just what you see on the surface. And again, these earthly physical things, they're significant. I thank God for the earthly things, the physical things that He brings, but our, our faith cannot depend on that. The, the, the value that we find in God, the worth that we find in God, cannot depend on those things. And so if you ask a question, okay, what is the other 97% of things that is underneath the surface of the water? Like, what are these blessings that God has given that are spiritual in nature? We know we can identify and detect physical blessings pretty easily, can we not? So the question is, we've got to learn to identify and detect what the spiritual blessings are. Well, Paul gives us three of these here in this passage. And so the first is, these are three praiseworthy truths about God. The first is, number one, God chose you before you chose Him. Can we just say that together? God chose you. God chose you before you chose Him. And if you could personalize that and say, God chose me before I chose Him. There's power in us understanding that. Look at what the passage says. Verse 3 of Ephesians 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now here, verse 4, talks about His choosing of us. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. So in terms of the chronology here, God chose us before the foundation of the world, before we were even born. God set His heart upon you. He chose you. It says, verse 5, that He predestined you. Now, if you want to um, derail any discussion and get into a deep debate, bring up the word predestination or election. Like things from that point forward get crazy and hairy because people a lot smarter than any of us have debated this very topic um, for upwards of 2,000 years. And so let me just say this on the front end with regard to predestination. The reason people talk about it is because it's a biblical concept. To predestine essentially just means to determine beforehand. And so when we see here that God has determined before and He has predestined us to adoption of sons, it raises all kinds of questions. Well, how could God do that? Does that mean that God didn't predestine others? He did predestine me. There are all kinds of questions that you can ask based upon that one question of predestination and election. And so what, what I'll say is this, that I quit debating that issue a long time ago. Like I quit fighting that battle because my feeble mind cannot comprehend the complexity and, and, and the, the, uh, the, the bigness of, of how it was that God in eternity past chose us and predestined us. But here's what I've come to in my life, and this is where I think it, it's helpful for all of us to get to a place to, to realize that God chose me even when he knew every dumb thing that I would ever do. Now, that's practically helpful. 
It may not be all that practically helpful to debate, well, did God predestine me because the he saw I would choose him, or did God just predestine me without ever knowing that I would choose him? You know, it, it may not be practically helpful to debate that, but what is practical is to know this, that before you were even born, God was able to see the whole span of time, and he saw that when you were five years old and 15 and 25 and 63, that you would have some lapses in judgment, that you would have some really, really bad decisions that would be consequential not only to you, but to other people in your life. And you would do things that would hurt you, that would hurt others, that would hurt the glory of God. You would do things where you would mess up and you would think to yourself, oh my word, I'm such a dunce. Like, how could I have done this? I cannot believe I found myself in this position again. Here's the the spiritual blessing that is practically helpful for you in this life is to know that this God that Paul is telling us about right here, he said, "I, I choose you anyway. And what that should do for you is to awaken in you this gratitude where you realize, oh, God chose me not because he saw that I was going to show up and worship him on a Sunday morning. God chose me not because he saw that I was going to work really hard and tell somebody about Jesus. God chose me not because he saw that I was going to give a portion of my income to the work of the church. God chose me because I was going to devote myself and serve more than other people. God chose me because of the goodness that he saw in me. It's just no, 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 brother, sister. God chose you, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. He has said, I choose you before you ever even have a chance to choose me. And so what this says to us is that for any person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ, who is saved, who is born again, who experiences eternal life, the reason that happened is because God chose you. And we can't stand back and say, yeah, God did this because I did this for him. We can't approach God in this transactional sort of way where we say, God, I have done this and this and this, and now you owe me. If we take that approach with God and we really want God to give us what we deserve, I promise you, that outcome is not going to be good for any of us. So we've got to distance ourselves from this idea that, that God treats us as our actions, our outward actions deserve. No, no, no. He doesn't give you what you deserve. He gives you grace, which is far better than that. And so the first spiritual truth that is a praiseworthy truth here is that God chose you before you chose him. Now, in your groups this evening, if you gather together, you can talk about predestination and election, and your group leader can get that all lined out for you. But for now, we're going to move on. Number two, so the first is God chose you before you chose him. Number two, God loved you before you loved him. What is, what is the foundation of that iceberg? What are the spiritual blessings that transcend any earthly physical thing? It's this idea that God set his love upon you before you had an opportunity to set your love upon him. Verse 4, Ephesians 1. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless in Him. What drove God to choose us? In love. So, first of all, we can make this confession. God chose me before I chose Him. And secondly, you can say this. God loved me before I loved Him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. God has committed himself to you eternally. It is a spiritual blessing. Paul will clarify for us later in chapter 2 that you have now been seated in the heavenlies in Christ. You have a secure place in the family of God because the love of the Father has been extended towards you. And when God makes a commitment to you, God does not back out on his commitment. He is a good, faithful Father. And in the midst of a time when we look at the the fruit tree of our life and we look at our circumstances and all we see are negative things, all we see are our circumstances that we don't want coming in our direction, we have to stop for just a moment and realize, no, 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 there's a good Father who is working and doing something greater than what I see in the circumstances around me. A good God that I can trust, who is a Father who loved me before I loved Him, who will love me even if I don't love Him, whose love for me is not conditional upon how much fruit 
I do or do not bear. There is a good God who has said, I'm committed to you and I love you. And that is that. I don't know. It just seems like to me that's something that we can praise Him for. The third praiseworthy truth we see in this passage, number one, God chose you before you chose Him. Number two, God loved me before I loved Him. And number three, God pursued you before you pursued Him. Do you know the reason you're seated here today? The the grand reason that you're seated here today is not because you just woke up and said, you know, I feel like following Jesus today. I feel like giving my life to Christ. I feel like being saved from my sins. The reason that you're here today is at some point or another, God in His sovereignty chose to work in your heart and chose to reveal a piece of Himself to you, chose to draw you into a relationship with Him, whereby based upon His choosing, based upon His drawing, based upon His pursuit of you, you in turn were able to pursue Him. And here's, you want, you want to hear something really, 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 really awesome? God didn't choose you because you were utilitarian. God didn't choose you because you were useful or practical. God chose you because He loved you. He didn't pursue you because he knew that at some point in the future, well, if I pursue them, that pursuit is sure going to pay off because I'm going to send my son Jesus Christ and, and offer this great sacrifice. And somehow, if they will work really hard and give lots of money and tell lots of people about Jesus and do lots of good deeds in my name, then somehow this investment I make into them will return. There, there will be dividends that I will receive back. That is an affront to the grace and the character of God to approach Him with this mindset that, okay, God, since you have given me the grace of Jesus Christ, now I'm going to repay you and make your sacrifice worth it. So, brother, sister, God did not send Jesus Christ to you and pursue you with His passionate intensity. He did not send His Holy Spirit to awaken you to your need for Jesus, to fill you with His Spirit, to empower you, to give you hope of eternity. He didn't do that for you so that you could do something for Him in return. That is a works-based understanding of your relationship with God, and it is a heresy that Satan would love for you to believe that it is just a lie that is straight from the pit of hell. And what we have to understand is that the reason that God has pursued us, it's not so that we could pay Him back. Now, we'll look later, Ephesians 2.10, that, that we were saved by grace through faith, all that, that we were saved unto good works. Like, God wants us to work. He wants us to serve. Like, He's pro-serving. Like, we can't be lazy in the grace that we receive. But we have to understand God's motive in operating And and blessing us with these spiritual blessings is not so that we could just turn around and do a lot of physical stuff in return for the blessings that He's given us. And so we have to see that God pursued us before we pursued Him. And when we come to understand that, that His ultimate worth to us, like how much we value Him, His ultimate worth to us, it does not depend on His immediate work in us. Because the things that we're talking about His choosing of us, His loving us, His pursuit of us. These are things that go far beyond the grave. Like when you die, that little tip of the iceberg portion of your life that you're experiencing right now, when you die, then you will be open to and discover the depth of the iceberg goes much deeper than what you see on the surface. Like there's this richness that you find in glory with Jesus where you realize that fullness of joy is not found in fullness of possessions, it's found in fullness of Jesus. And, and the, the motive and the drive that God has to mature you, to grow you in your faith, is to help you while you're here on this earth to start looking up right now and appreciate the spiritual blessings that has given you that last beyond the grave, that moth and rust cannot destroy where thieves cannot break in and steal. And some people say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I, I don't know that I've mer- ever met anybody who was so truly heavenly minded that they were not earthly good. The people who are our most effective citizens of this kingdom on this earth are the ones who are our are, are most focused on the kingdom of heaven and eternity. And there's power in it. So here's what I want to do. I, I want to close today. Hopefully you, you get this idea that, that His worth to you can't depend on His immediate work in you. 
I want to close today by, by giving you a vision, a prayer. This is something that you can write down on your mirror. This is something that you can rehearse in your mind. It is a prayer that is easy to say, but it is really hard to live. But I'm telling you, this is powerful, powerful stuff. It's written by a guy named Habakkuk who's a prophet uh, who came to the nation of Israel and was preparing them for a terrible time that they were about to undergo. The nation of Israel, long story short, was about to be taken into captivity. They were going to be plundered. Their homes were going to be destroyed. They were about to go to the fruit tree of circumstances in their life, and it was going to be destroyed. So Habakkuk is preparing himself and preparing the people for what is about to happen. And I want you to receive this as a personal vision and a personal prayer for your life. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. He says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. You get what he's saying here. Though life stinks. Verses 18 and 19. This is my prayer for you. Though there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on high places. God's ultimate worth to me does not depend on His immediate work in me. God's ultimate worth to me depends on His ultimate work in Christ on my behalf for eternity. And I will not evaluate the goodness of God, the heart of God, the grace of God to me through the lens of me going to the tree of my circumstances today and not finding what it is that I want. I will not be deceived by Satan into believing that just because good things aren't happening Happening to me, it does not mean that God does not have good things in store for me for eternity. I will turn right around and I will say, yes, life stinks right now. There are no cattle in the stalls. The job did not work out. The prognosis is not good. Yet I will praise God. That's the heart of what I want to say to you this morning. And so here's what this passage might look like if we, if we translated it into 2017 vernacular. Though the car breaks down and the repairs are high, yet I will praise the Lord. Though the marriage fails and the ex gets more visitation rights, yet I will praise the Lord. Though the disease returns And the prognosis is 6 to 12 months. Yet I will praise the Lord. Though the hymn is old and the style is outdated. Yet I will praise the Lord. Though the chorus is new and the volume is loud. Yet I will praise the Lord. Though the economy tanks and the factory shuts down. Yet I will praise the Lord. Though my depression returns and my heart is dull, yet I will praise the Lord. Though the team loses and the season is over, yet I will praise the Lord. Though someone else gets the promotion that I worked for and I deserve, yet I will praise the Lord. Though I look to the olive tree and it has failed, though I look to the fruit tree of my circumstances and I say, God, I don't like what I see, yet I will praise the Lord. You want to know one thing that ought to distinguish a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ from the rest of the world? It's that when bad things happen to you, the way you respond ought to be different than the way the rest of the world responds. Bonds because what you see is the big picture, not just what's happening around you. And one reason we push back against the, the health and wealth idea of, of prosperity gospel is because we believe this, that God is greater than health and wealth. God is greater than earthly prosperity. And what God gives to us is eternal riches. Brother, sister, that needs to be our heart. 
And if, if we can get to a place where His ultimate worth to us does not depend on His immediate work in us, well then, brother, I think we're getting somewhere. I think we're growing up in our faith. It's my prayer for you. It's my prayer for me that God would do that in us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus, for your grace to us. And I pray as we have this moment to consider the depth of the spiritual blessings you've given us in eternity, that we would be people who, like Habakkuk, have, have turned our attention toward eternity so much so that, that when negative things happen in our life, we still get frustrated, we still get disheartened, but those things don't defeat us. They just, they just push us toward embracing further this truth that we are made to live on this earth for 70, 80, 90 years, and then we're done. We're created for eternity, and we need to live in light of that. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.